And this would be an English section. And I'm sorry, terribly sorry for the slide of problem yesterday. And today we'll make sure that the problem, uh, the questions on slide is asked if the time is allowed. And the speaker of our next session is Sebastian, and he's a uh, Python consultant and freelancer. And today he's give a talk about what iPython can do. That's about the tricks of using iPython. So let's welcome him. All right. Hi, everyone. Can, Hi. Can, Hi. Does, it, does it work? Can you hear me? Uh, no. no. Uh, Maybe you try to solve it, we'll fix the technical issue. Hi. Um, I have to, where is the, oh, the oh, wait. here. Yep. Is it working? We have lots of here. Okay. This, this is not. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Sebastian. I write Python code for a living, and I also teach others how to write Python. Is it working? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to switch. Ah, okay, I'm gonna move here. Is it still working? No. It stopped working. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? I can speak, yeah. use this one. Yeah. Okay, back to this one. Um, so you can find me on Twitter if you have any questions or comments, uh, that's probably the easiest way to get in touch. And sometimes I'm blogging at this URL, and I have a few blog posts about IPython, so if you're interested, um, you can check it out. So two technical remarks before we start. Uh, first, there will be a lot of features that I want to talk about, and the fact that I messed up my talk submission and I proposed a 45-minute long talk for a 30-minute slot is not going to help. So if you missed something from my presentation, here is the link to the slides. I will also share the link at the end of my talk. And finally, I'm using version 7.4 of IPython and 3.7 of Python in case you want to reproduce something that I will be showing. So I'm, why am I giving a talk about IPython? Well, I've been using IPython for over six years and I thought everyone else from Python community is doing the same, which apparently is not true. Some people don't even know about IPython at all. Some people just use a small subset of its features. But IPython is much more than just syntax highlighting or tab completion. So I've decided to gather the most interesting talk, most in interesting features of IPython and show you how you can use them to boost your productivity. So IPython is a REPL. If you're not familiar with this term, it stands for Read, Eval, Print, Loop. So it's a type of shell that reads a command evaluates it, prints the results, and waits for another command. So IPython is basically a Python REPL on steroids. And I mean a massive dose of steroids. Do you guys, did you guys ever hear about Pokemon? Okay, so it's a pretty familiar concept. So I like to think of Python REPL as Pikachu. You know, it's a small companion that helps programmers in their journey with Python. And then there is IPython. <laughs> so it has syntax highlighting. It has tab completion. And not only for keywords, modules, methods, variables, but also for files in the current directory and for Unicode characters. It has smart indentation. So when you start writing a function and, or when you start writing a loop and you press enter, it automatically indents the next line. You can search in the history, either with arrow, arrow up and down, or you can use Control R and search properly in the history. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. IPython has also extensions, magic functions, shell commands, events, hooks, macros, lightweight storage. It's fully configurable. You can swap kernels. You can use it for debugging, asynchronous code, and many, many more. So what I really love about IPython is how easily you can access the documentation of basically any object. Classes, variables, functions, modules, you name it. All you need to do is to append or prepend a question mark to the name of the object. And if you want to see the whole source code of an object, you need to use double question mark. Also, a nice trick. Uh, if you're not sure what's the name of a function that you want to call, you can use stars as wildcards. And you will see all the functions that are matching certain strings. So here, I want to run a function from the OS module, and I vaguely remember that it has dir in the name, 
So I'm just listing all the functions that have dir in the name. So IPython stores the input and output of each command that you run in the current session. It also stores the input of the previous sessions, and if you enable it in the settings, it will store the output as well. If you want to access those cached variables, there are many different ways how you can do this. Each of them will be stored in a separate variable or in a list or in a dictionary. You might be wondering, why do I care about input and output caching? Well, did you ever run a command that returns some value only to realize later that you actually want to do something with this value? I mean, I did, many, many times. And if it's a fast command, then it's, it's not a problem. You can just rerun it. But if it's a slow command, or if you can't just rerun it because, for example, your authentication token has expired, then you have a problem. Well, unless you're using IPython where everything is cached, so you can just go back and ret retrieve the value from the cache. So one of the coolest functions of, uh, one of the coolest features of IPython are the magic functions. It's a bunch of helper methods that starts with one or two percentage signs. Why the percentage sign? Well, to distinguish them from the standard Python functions as they behave slightly different. For example, they don't require parentheses when you're passing arguments. Just keep in mind that in Python, methods, the dunder methods, so methods starting with one or two underscores, are also sometimes called magic methods or magic functions. And those methods have nothing to do with IPython magic functions. So there are two types of magic functions, line magics and cell magics. So line magic functions are similar to shell commands. They don't require parentheses when you're passing arguments. If a function is starting with two percentage signs, then it's a cell magic. Cell magics can accept multiple lines of input. You can pass arguments right after the function name, then you press enter, and then you type the code that you want, that you want the function to run on. And to let the cell magic function know that you're done with typing and that it should run now, you need to press enter twice. As of version 7.4 of IPython, there were 124 magic functions. I'm not going to discuss all of them. I have a few that I'm using quite often, but it's still too much to show you all of them, especially since the documentation for magic functions is pretty good. So if there are some functions here that you don't recognize, I suggest you take a look and maybe you will find them useful. Sorry. So I will quickly show you a few interesting ones. As I said before, IPython keeps the track of commands that you run, and the history function is, can be used to print those commands back. It can be run with no parameters. In this case, it will print you the whole history for the current session, or you can run it with a number specifying which line of the history you want to print. I'm actually showing you the history because it's one of a few functions in IPython that can accept a range of lines as a parameter. And the range of lines is quite interesting, so let's take a closer look at how it works. There are a few ways in IPython that you can specify a range of lines. The simple one is to use a dash between two numbers. And you can even mix ranges and single lines, also it's fine if the ranges are overlapping or if they are duplicated. And if you want to reference lines from the previous sessions, you can specify the session number, add a front slash, and then line number or a range. It's great, but usually you don't remember how many IPython sessions you had before. Like, here I had 457 when I was preparing this slide. So, IPython accepts a different notation. With a tilde character prefix, you can say, I want to print history from that many sessions before the current one. So in the third example, we are printing the line number seven from two sessions ago. And also, if you want to print the whole session, you can just keep the range parameter after the slash. And finally, you can provide a range across multiple sessions. So in the last example, I want to print the history from the first line eight sessions ago until the fifth line six sessions ago. And even though writing multiple lines of code in IPython is easier than it is in the default Python repo because we have the smart indentation, you can always make it even easier with the edit magic function. So it will open a temporary file in your favorite editor where you can type the code 
and after you save and close this file, IPython will execute it. Also, each time you run edit with no parameters, it's gonna open a new file. So if you want to go back and edit the same file as last time, you have to provide the P parameter. And finally, if you don't want to type this percentage edit, you can just press F2 as a shortcut. What's really cool about the edit function is that it can accept an argument, and depending on what this argument is, it will behave differently. If it's a file name, IPython will open that file. If it's a range from the history, IPython will open a new file and copy those commands to this file. If it's a variable, IPython will open a new file and put the content of this variable inside that file. If it's an object, but not a variable, for example, if it's a function name, IPython will try to figure out in which file this function is defined, then it will open that file exactly on the line where the function definition is starting, which is pretty cool. And finally, if you recorded a macro, you can pass the name of the macro to edit it. Run magic command will, will run a Python script. It seems pretty straightforward, but I find it very useful when I'm writing a module and I want to test it. So if I change the module and I can't, if I change the module after I imported it, I can't just re-import it. I would need to use the reload function from the import lib library. So simply running and rerunning the module is gonna be much more convenient for me. As a bonus point, there is a configuration option of IPython called auto reload. If you enable it, IPython will always reload the whole module before running a function from that module. And there are many other magic functions that you can use to, for example, rerun some commands or edit them before running, save commands as a macro, save them in a file or in a paste bin so you can share it with your colleague, save macros, variables, or aliases in the database so you can retrieve them back in a different IPython session, or print a list of variables or functions that you have defined. So far, all the magic functions that I mentioned here were line magics. As for cell magics, there is a whole collection of functions that you can use to run a piece of code written in a different programming language. One of the most interesting cases is if you want to quickly run Python 2 code. So I'm assuming that you're using Python 3, and then you can just type double percentage sign Python 2, write the code in Python 2, and press un enter two times, and IPython will execute this code with no problem. It also works with other languages like Bash or Ruby or JavaScript out of the box. Notice how IPython is actually correctly highlighting the Ruby syntax in this last example. So what if those 124 magic functions are not enough? Well, you can easily write your own magic function. All you have to do is write a function and decorate it with either register line magic or register cell magic decorator, and that's it. So for example, here I'm creating a magic function that will reverse any string that I pass. If you're looking for a more advanced example, I wrote a short step-by-step -step guide how to create a cell magic function that will run the mypy type checker on a block of code. So creating magic functions is easy, but to be able to run our magic function, we had to copy and paste our code into IPython, which is very inconvenient if you want to run it more often. So we might want to turn our magic function into an extension. Extensions in IPython are an easy way to make your magic functions reusable and to share them with others. And they are not limited only to the magic function. You can write some code that modifies any part of IPython, like from custom key bindings, custom colors, modification to the IPython configuration, and you can turn this code into an extension. To create an extension, you need to create a file that contains the load IPython extension function, and this is the function that is executed when you load the function, and then you need to put the magic method inside that function. And finally, you have to save this file in a folder called IPython slash extensions. So now if we start IPython and load our magic function, and our magic function will automatically start working. So we can use the magic function in our code. You probably noticed that this deprecation warning at the top, and you might be wondering why am I showing you something that is deprecated? 
Well, it's not really deprecated. It's just a subtle way of IPython telling you like, hey, I see that you created an extension. How about you share it with others? So if you want, your IPython extension can be very easily published on PyPI. And if you want to search for the existing extensions, the two most popular places are the extension index, which is a wiki page on the IPython repository, and the IPython filter in the PyPI package index. So what else can you do with IPython? You can, for example, run shell commands. So each command that are starting with exclamation mark will be treated as shell command. And some of the most common ones, like the CD or LS, they will work even without the ex exclamation mark prefix. You can create aliases. So aliases in IPython are basically the same thing as aliases in Linux. They will let you call a system command under a different name. And they can also accept positional parameters. Speaking of aliases, there is a really cool and probably not very well-known magic function called rehash x. So it will load all the executables from the path variable into the IPython session, which basically means that now you can call any shell command right from IPython, which is pretty cool little curiosity. Like, here I'm just starting a node repo inside the IPython repo, and it's working. So IPython has four different settings of how verbose the exceptions should be. And you can change between them with the X mode magic function. So you can select the lowest amount of information, the more, more verbose one, and even more, so this is the default one, and this is the most verbose one that will also print you the local and global variables for a given level of stack trace. And starting from version 7 of IPython, you can actually execute asynchronous code by using await wherever you want. So if you try to put await in a top-level scope in a standard Python REPL, you're going to get a syntax error. However, IPython has implemented some hacks to make it work. So if you're playing with asynchronous code and you want to quickly await for an asynchronous function, this is a great way to do this. Just keep in mind that this is not actually a valid Python code, so don't put it in production. IPython comes with a lot of good defaults. In fact, I never actually felt the need to modify the configuration file, but if you want to change something, it's very easy to do this. The default configuration lives in the IPython config file, and this is where it's located for the current user. Well, actually, when you first install IPython for the first time, the file is not there. You will have to create it with the IPython profile create command. And if you look inside that file, you will see a huge amount of options that you can change. For example, you can execute some specific lines when IPython starts. You can execute some files, you can load some extensions, you can change the color schema, you can change the exception mode, or select a different editor for the edit command. If you look what else is inside the IPython slash profile default, you will see a lot of diff you will see a bunch of directories. Most of them are internal to IPython, but there is actually one that is particularly interesting for us. It's called startup, and by default, it contains just a readme file that explains what's the purpose of this directory. So basically, any file with PY or IPY extension that you put in this directory will be executed when IPython starts. So you can use this folder to define some helper functions or magic methods. Remember when we wrote our magic method and we had to create an extension to be able to use this magic method between sessions? Well, an easier solution would be to just create a file in the startup directory and put the code of our magic method there. Just keep in mind that whatever you put in this folder gets executed each time IPython starts. So if you put a bunch of slow functions there, it's gonna make the startup of IPython very slow. So in this case, it's better to create a separate profile for those slow functions. Profiles are like accounts on your computer. Each profile is a separate directory in the .ipython folder, so each has its own configuration and startup files. You can create a new, new profile by running ipython profile create command, and then to start ipython with that profile, you have to do ipython with the profile option. So another two interesting features of IPython are events and hooks. 
IPython defines a set of events, like before I run the code, after I run the code, after I start IPython, and you can easily plug a custom function that will be executed during those events. For example, here, I'm creating a function that will print the list of variables after I execute each cell. All I need to do is to create a function and then connect it to an event inside this load IPython extension. Hooks are a bit similar to the events, but they are executed at different situations. For example, when you're opening the editor with edit magic command, or when you're shutting down IPython, or when you're copying text from clipboard. The main difference between events and hooks is how they are intended to work. Events are mostly meant for people writing extensions. You can have a bunch of callback functions connected to the same event, and they will all be executed when the event happens. Hooks, on the other hand, will only call one function. So if you have multiple functions attached to a hook, IPython will call the first one, and if it's successful, it won't call the others. But if the function throws an exception, IPython will try to call the next function, and the next one, and the next one, until it finds one that is successful. For example, you can create your own function that will be executed when the editor is open. This function will try to use the jet editor instead of the default one. And if there is an error with the jet editor, we throw the try next, try next exception. That way, IPython knows that it should try to open another editor instead of failing. Moving on to the next feature, debugging. So IPython is my default debugging tool. It all started because I was using Sublime Text for a very long time, and I only recently switched to Visual Studio Code, which has a pretty good debugger, but using the one from IPython still works for me most of the cases. So this is how I use IPython as my debugger. First thing that you can do is to embed IPython anywhere in your code. To do that, you need to in import the embed function from IPython and then just call it. I like to put those two statements on one line so I can remove them with just one keystroke and all the code linters will actually complain about it so I don't forget to remove it when I'm done. So now I can run my script and when the interpreter gets to that line, it will open the IPython shell. I will have access to all the variables set at that point so I can poke around and see what's going on with my code. And when I'm, uh oh, it broke. Hello, the battery, ah, is it work? Ah, perfect, I'm back. Um, and so when I'm done, I just exit I Python. I, I think it's the word in my talk that just makes it turn off. You can, you can just use this. Oh. Perfect, so as I was saying, uh, when I'm done, I just exit I Python and the code execution will continue. And the nice thing is that if I change some variables inside I Python, those changes will persist when I close the embedded session. So embedding is nice, but it's not really debugging. To actually run the debugger, you can use the run magic method with the minus D parameter and specify the file that you want to run. IPython will then run the file through the, debug, through the IPDB debugger and put a breakpoint on the first line. And now my favorite part of IPython, the post-mortem debugger. So imagine you're running a, you're running a long-running Python script. A long-running Python script. <laughs> and suddenly it crashes because that's what software do. And now you're probably sitting there and thinking, man, I wish I ran this script with a debugger enabled. Now I have to enable the debugger, rerun the script, and wait again to see what's the problem. Well, no, you don't. At least when you're, not when you're using IPython. You can run the debug magic after the exception happened, and it will start the debugger for the last exception. You can inspect variables, you can move up and down the stack trace, so the same stuff that you can do with the standard debugger. Finally, if you want to automatically start the debugger when an exception happens, there is a magic function called PDB that you can use to enable this behavior. So that was debugging. Another interesting set of functions is related to profiling your code. 
if you're curious how slow your code is, or what's more important, where is the bottleneck, IPython has a few magic tricks up, it, up its sleeve. So the first magic function is called time. It's the most simple way to measure the execution time of a piece of code. It will run your code once and print how long it took according to the CPU and wall clock. A um, much more interesting function is the one called time it. By default, it will automatically determine how many times your code should run to give, to, to give you the reliable results. So for a very fast function, it can run a few thousand times, and for a slow one, it might run just a few times. There's also a cell magic version of time it. It's more convenient if you want to measure a code that has multiple lines. So one nice thing about the cell version of time it is that after the arguments, you can also pass some setup code, and this code will be executed, but it won't be the part of measurement. Once we know that our code is slow, we probably want to see how exactly it's slow. Why? Why exactly it's slow? What's taking so much time? So we can use the prun magic function, and it will show us a nice overview of what was the total time spent calling a function, where. Um, what was the total time calling a function, how many times a given function was called, where a given function is located. So here we can see that our slow function is running for 12 seconds and performing 50 million operations, and most of the time is spent in a function called check factor in a file called myfile.py. So now we can go there and check what's wrong with the function and maybe we can make it faster. Another interesting type of profiler is line profiler. The prun will report how much time each function took, but the line profiler, or LP run, will give you an even more detailed information and show you a line-by-line -line report of how your code was executed. So since this profiler is not included by default with IPython, you have to install it with pip and load it as an extension. Once you do this, you can use the magic LP run command. So to run this profiler, you need two parts. You need a statement, so a function or a piece of code that will be executed, and then you need to specify which functions you want to profile. So let's see an example. Here I'm running a function called long running script, and I want to profile two functions, the long running script itself and the important function. So line profiler will generate this nice report for each function that I specify, where I can see how many times each line was run how much time Python spent on this line, and how much percent of the total running time was spent on a given line. And the last profiler I want to mention is called Memory Profiler, and as the name suggests, you can use it to profile your memory usage. Again, we have to install it with pip and load it as an extension, and you run it basically the same way as the line profiler. So you provide the statement and the name of the function that you want to profile. And finally, you get an output that is similar to the previous profiler. So you can see how the memory usage changed between each line of your code. So in IPython, the evaluation part of the REPL happens in a separate process. It means that the process evaluating the code, called kernel, can be decoupled from the rest of IPython. It has one great advantage. IPython is not limited just to Python programming language. You can easily swap kernels and use IPython with a completely different programming language. The interface won't change, but a different interpreter will be running your code. So if you want to quickly run some Ruby or JavaScript code, that's one way to do this. So for example, if you install the iJulia kernel and you run IPython with this new kernel, you will be able to execute Julia code right from IPython REPL. As you can see, REPL still looks the same, but now you can use Julia syntax. And if you try to write Python code, you will actually get an error. And if you really love IPython, there is still a bunch of crazy stuff that you can do. So you can enable auto calls, so you don't have to use brackets when calling functions. Or you can start a line with a comma, so you don't even have to put quotes around the arguments that you pass to a function. You can enable the auto-reloading that I mentioned before, so you can change the imported modules on the fly, and you don't have to re-import them after it change. And if you're writing doc test, you can turn on the doc test mode to make coping code from IPython much, much easier. 
You can use the demo mode to create nice interactive demos of your code in the terminal. You can even use IPython as your shell, which would require, for example, changing the prompt to show you the current directory, enabling the auto calls, and running rehash x for the aliases. Or you can add custom keyboard shortcuts, or custom input transformations, or if you're brave enough, AST transformations. And since this is already a talk about a Python repl replacement, it wouldn't be fair to at least not mention the alternatives. So there are three main ones, bpython, ptpython, and conch shell. So bpython and ptpython are much lighter, much more lightweight than ipython, and, but they have less features. So if you're looking for a REPL that fits between the standard Python REPL and IPython, you can check them out. And conch is quite different from IPython because it's not actually a REPL, it's a shell. It adds Python on top of Bash, so you can actually use both. So it's also an interesting project if you want to use Python directly in your shell. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you for listening. Maybe we have, still have time for uh, one question. And the most popular question is, do you suggest Newbie to simply try Google Colabs if there, uh, is there any difference in the feature set? Um, to be honest, it's the first time I hear about Google Colab, so I have no idea how to compare it, sorry. So, oh, so there is a comment or question from Oh, <laughs> the Jupyter Steering Council member. And, or, and Gretel, Jupyter cannot buy Python, so the features you covered can be used inside Jupyter since the default iPython, the Python kernel is iPython kernel. Yeah, so yeah. that's a very good point. I didn't have time to include it in my presentation, but basically iPython is what's running underneath Jupyter. So all the features from iPython can be used in Jupyter, and then Jupyter has a lot of other stuff on top of it. Um, unfortunately, we are kind of run out of time, but there is some qu uh, question out there uh, I'm personally curious about, so if you still have questions, please do come to the front and ask Sebastian. And thanks, uh, please give another round of applause to uh, Sebastian. And yeah.